Turn your Bibles, if you would, to the Gospel of Mark chapter 9. <clears throat> Mark chapter 9. I mentioned uh, a couple months ago, I felt like I needed to take at least this summer, I don't know, maybe a little longer, we'll see, um, the times that I talk to bring up subjects that are very, very familiar for us. But uh, the analogy that came to my mind here a couple months ago was when a trucker takes off with his load, he will drive a distance and oftentimes pull over and tighten down the load. And after this last year, I think we have a load that needs to be tightened. And, uh, and so I, I have felt the need to review some things, and so that's what I've been doing. And I'm going to talk to you about one of my most uh, favorite subjects today, and I'm going to look at a story uh, that is a favorite story. Uh, I, I read these to learn. There, there are nuances in these stories that I need so much because I, the longer I walk with Jesus, the more I find out he thinks different than me and he's not going to change. And uh, I'm, I'm the one that's to change. So that's the journey I'm on. So what I'm going to do though is I'm going to, we're going to take a story out of Mark 9, but I'm going to read a verse out of Matthew 13, out of the parable of the seed and the sower. I know that it is sometimes dangerous to take elements out of one parable or one story and mix them with another because they don't always translate well story to story. And you can sometimes end up with false information. I know that that's true. So I'm just warning you ahead of time, I'm going to do that. And uh, you'll have to figure it out. Um, I know that sometimes, uh, or for example, uh, the fire of God is always the judgment of God, except that one time in Acts 2, when the fire of God was the tongues of fire, and tongues are a language of praise, and it's for edification. So it's far from judgment. The snake is always the devil. I accept that one time. <laughs> it was Jesus on a cross who became sin on our behalf. Earthquakes were always judgment. Yeah, except for that one time in Acts 4, <laughs> when in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the entire place was shook because of the presence of God. So what you don't want to do is become too rigid. And so I'm, I'm going to ask you to approach these two stories loosely because I think one will actually give us the insight we need for the next one, all right? So this is what we're going to start, is the parable of the seed and the sower. Now, because we're not doing the whole story, I'm just going to read one verse. I want to remind you, if you're unfamiliar with the story, parable of the seed and the sower, the seed in this parable is the word of God. The soil is the condition of the heart. Here's a very important lesson. The productiveness or the fruitfulness of a word that God spoke does not validate whether or not it was from God. Because that parable actually gives us four different kinds of soil. Three were no good. The word was authentic, but it just didn't bear fruit. The fault wasn't what God said. See, many people make the mistake of saying, well, we, will, we, will, we judge a tree by its fruit. That's absolutely right. But they will say, well, we'll know whether this was a work of God or not by the fruit. Not always. Jesus talked about healing 10 lepers. Only one had a character change enough to return and give thanks. Did it mean the other nine were falsely healed? No. God's word, the validity of his word is not validated by what we do with it. In other words, it's not proven by what we do with it. God's not on trial by what I do. I am. In this particular illustration, we have in verse 22, the, he who receives seed among thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. So here's the picture. My, my wife is the master gardener. She has not been gardening. She's been too sick. We have a garden, though. The pepper plants are not this tall. It's the weeds that are this tall. <laughs> we have been invaded by the weeds in this garden. And it's because we planted certain seeds, but not being able to take care and tend the garden, 
We have other seeds that have competed for the nutrients, observed the moisture, and have outgrown and actually cast shadow or shade over the plants that were supposed to be prolific and grow and provide food. The word of the Lord is the same way. Faith comes by what? Hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Say that with me. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Say it again. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. It does not say faith comes from hearing the word of God. If it did, then let's all of us go home, put on YouTube where they're quoting scripture for the next 24 hours. Let's have it playing 24 seven in our sleep and we'll have the Wiggles, Wigglesworth kind of faith by Friday. <laughs> it, it just, it doesn't work that way. Faith comes from hearing. It's, it's your connection to the voice of God, but the voice of God is activated by your exposure to the word. It's the word that enhances and trains the hearing. Now here's the challenge, is I've got a word that God spoke to me, but I have another idea, and I have a disappointment, and I've got this criticism, and I've got this complaint, and I've got all these seeds that are vying for the same nutrients, and what does the Bible say happens? It says the cares of this world, the other interests, the other burdens or concerns, busyness is artificial significance. The enemy works to expand our busyness to increase our cares. The enemy works to expand our activity to increase our cares. Because if he can increase our cares, he plants seeds that compete with the word of God. Mark chapter nine. Verse 17, we're gonna read quite a few verses, so please do uh, follow in your Bible or your neighbors as much as you can, please. Verse 17. Then one of the crowd answered and said, teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth gnashes at the teeth, gnashes his teeth, becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it up, but they could not. And he answered him and said, oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? Let me stop there. I'm, I'm annoyed by, I love this translation, but I'm annoyed by their use, use of this word faithless because that's not what it says. The literal word is the word unbelief. And there's a difference between faithless and unbelief. Unbelief is not the absence of faith. It's the presence of unbelief. There is a difference. Later he says, I believe, but help me in my unbelief. The problem is, is you can have more than one seed growing in your garden. To say it's a faithless garden is not accurate. There's faith in the garden. Are you following my analogy here? To call it faithless is not, is not accurate. There's just unbelief there. People come to me and they say, well, I'm, I'm more of, uh, I have an intellectual bent. Oh, you mean you have an unbelieving bent? <laughs> it's nothing to be proud of. God's quite smart and it doesn't interfere with his faith. So if my intellect is affecting my faith, then I know the wrong things. The knowledge of the tree of good and evil, I know the wrong things. I, I fill my garden with seeds that compete with what God is saying. They compete with my destiny. True faith gives you access to your greatest point of intelligence. I believe in the days ahead, we're going to see the greatest intellectualism come out of faith. Yes, Bill, amen, keep it up. The Bible says, by faith we understand. The worlds are made out of nothing. By faith we understand. We don't understand by faith. We, we don't understand 
excuse me, we don't believe because we understand. We understand because we believe. Faith gives us access to a level of understanding you can't get through human reasoning. All right. I feel like I'm preaching all by myself here. It's all right. I'm not going to quit. No, sir, I'm not going to quit. I'm, I'm teasing. I'm just happy to see so many people in the room. There's humans. I just want you to know this. Last year I discovered I was addicted to humans. All right. Let's, uh, let's move on here. Verse 19, he answered and said to him, O faithless generation, I'm going to change it. He answered and said to him, O unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Then they brought him to him, and when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. Why would he do that in front of Jesus? Because I think it worked in front of the disciples. If you can create enough disturbance with what you see in the natural, it can interfere with what you see in the spirit. The enemy was working to create a disturbance that they saw here that helped them, that caused them to no longer see what they saw here. And that was what God had already willed to happen. Faith doesn't deny a problem's existence. It just denies the problem a place of influence. They brought him to him. He threw him on the ground, wallowed, forming at the mouth. Verse 21. So he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. It's interesting. It's the smallest measure of faith I can find in the entire Bible. If there's a smaller one, please show it to me. This one barely moved the needle. When you come to God and say, if you can. (laughs) God, if you have the ability to do this big problem. And the Lord turned the table on him and said, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. I've got more than one plant growing in my garden. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him, enter him no more. When the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, it came out of him. And he became as one dead, so that many said, he is dead. Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up, he arose. And when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? And he said, this kind comes out by nothing but prayer and fasting. We've got several things that I want to point out in this story. First of all, picture a garden. We have raised beds in our house. We didn't raise them from the dead. They're actually just (laughs) elevated. Organic soil, everything. And picture the plant you want to grow and next to it a plant you didn't plant and all these things are competing for air, for uh, for, uh, sun, for nutrients, for uh, water. And there's this competition that's going on. We have an automatic watering system and it waters the weeds too. I'm trying to figure out how you can get a watering system that only waters the plants. I mean, we've got an orchard and we've got trees growing, but we also have weeds growing because they found out there's water there. The point I'm trying to make is the water of God's presence waters all seeds. Whatever seed is planted will become manifest by the presence of the Lord because it will begin to manifest. Let me illustrate this because you need to catch this to understand how the Lord works here. When he exposes, for example, you're just driving along and you find this just just a little bit of an angry attitude or or just an arrogant attitude, whatever, just begins to 
creep up. The Lord in his mercy through his presence is exposing a seed that wants permission to be planted. You have a quick moment to deal with it repentantly, in, in repentance so that it doesn't set down roots. Because once it sets down roots, certainly it can be removed, but it starts affecting personality. And so quick repentance is the, is the best. You're driving down, you see that attitude where, no, oh, they just think they know. And all of a sudden you realize, oh, that's arrogance. God, forgive me. Quickly repent. Then turn and bless that person. I'm trying to have shorter and shorter times between the exposure of something and the quick repentance. Don't go into guilt and shame because it gives you a false sense of spirituality. It creates a, it creates a sense of humility that mimics humility, but it's not humility. It doesn't give you access to what humility gives you access to. And so doing the guilt-shame thing, oh, I did it again. Don't go there because then you're making an agreement with the accuser that's trying to draw you into the sin in the first place. If he can't get me into this sin, then he wants me to become arrogant over the fact that I'm dealing with the sin. Uh, that's, that's too big of a hole to fall into, so forgive me, I'll pull out of that one. Let me illustrate this uh, concept that the presence of the Lord causes all seeds to water. Picture with me the Last Supper. This is the most intense and intimate moment like ever. They know, they can feel it in the air. Something's about to happen. Jesus knows he's about to go to the cross. He's got the 12 there. In this intense moment of divine presence, this intimate moment, we see John with his head on Jesus' chest. We have Peter announcing, I will never deny you. And we have Judas walking out of the room to betray him because all seeds are watered in the presence. They all become manifest in these moments. Wisdom is to recognize when the Lord is bringing something to the surface and in that moment, he's giving you a grace. Deal with it quickly. Deal with it thoroughly. If you're like me, you find all kinds of things planted in your garden bed. You've got the word of the Lord over your life. But like this guy, in all honesty, you say, God, I do believe. You are my confidence. But I'm fighting. I've got some unbelief too. See, we've thought that the answer to this challenge is to have bigger faith. Jesus actually canceled out that concept of faith size as being the answer when he said faith just the size of a mustard seed could take Mount Shasta and put it in the Pacific Ocean. That's not just a nice, warm, fuzzy illustration. It's not a motivational point. It's not a rah-rah on Jesus' behalf. It's a statement of fact. Something this small can move something that big if it's by itself. See, the problem is I got other plants in my garden. This particular story, the disciples were presented with a case to bring deliverance to a child. I'll never forget as long as I live, probably 20, probably 24, 23, 24 years ago, I was in a meeting and a mom brought a little child to me that was demonized like that child. Very similar. Very violent, very, it was horrible. I did everything I knew to do. I've ministered in deliverance many, many times. I, I, I pulled out all the weapons and nothing happened. And I'll never forget the mom looking at me with her tormented child saying, what do I do now? And giving some stupid answer that didn't please her or me. Because sometimes you don't drive out a problem with power. You only do it through authority. And learning how to minister in authority is different than ministering in power. Authority is needed to deal with authority. Authority is needed to deal with this kind of obstacle, this kind of a problem. 
The father couldn't do it, so he brought him to the disciples. Now, I remind you, the disciples are the most skilled and trained people in the area of deliverance to ever live up until that point. Nobody had the experience they had. No one had the insights. Nobody had the history, the testimony. No one. Jesus could trust them enough to send them in groups of two to a city and clean out the place. All the demonized are freed, and the people that are tormented and sick are healed, and all this stuff went on. In fact, it was so impacting that in Luke chapter 10, Jesus adds 70 more to the group and sends them out. Picture this. He sends out 82 folks. They go out. They come back. They are so excited because demons were subject to them. And Jesus says, by the way, he says, I saw Satan fall like lightning. So he's responding to their success, if we can. He's responding to the impact of their anointing, their gift, their ministry. He's, Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning. Just don't make that your point of joy. Make your point of joy the fact that your name is written in my book. Your name is written in my book. Great story, great point, but here we are. We've got those with the greatest expertise couldn't bring healing, deliverance to this child. The dad was lucky enough to see Jesus coming and he brought the child to Jesus. <clears throat> Jesus wasn't impressed by the demonic manifestation. Sometimes we take our identity in the size of our problem. Be careful how you describe your problem. Because sometimes we'd actually rather have sympathy from a friend than breakthrough from a person of faith. I'm not saying don't share. I'm just saying be careful where your heart is going because sometimes we feed on that stuff. So it brings him to Jesus. Jesus was unmoved by the demonic manifestation, brought deliverance to the child. The disciples saw it. And it says they took Jesus aside and they asked him, how come we couldn't do it? Jesus gave them this profound advice. This kind only comes out with prayer and fasting, which I'll talk about in a minute. For me, the biggest lesson in this story is that when the disciples couldn't bring about a breakthrough, they didn't create a theology around what didn't happen. They didn't look for biblical reasons why it wasn't God's will to deliver that child. Instead, they took Jesus aside and they asked, why not? I pray the day comes for you and for me that instead of being shocked when the breakthrough happens, we're shocked when it doesn't. Shocked enough to take Jesus aside and ask him to please explain why it didn't work on this situ in this occasion. Jesus said, this kind only comes out with prayer and fasting. But he neither prayed nor fasted. We know Jesus fasted. The one time we know that he fasted was 40 days when it, at the beginning of his ministry. It's kind of at the initiation. But he didn't, I'm not saying it's wrong, but he just, he didn't fast for a problem. He fasted into a lifestyle. So Jesus said, this kind only comes out with prayer and fasting. Then neither prayed nor fasted and brought deliverance. What did Jesus identify as the problem in this story? Unbelief. Unbelief was the problem. What did the dad think the problem was? A demon. Yes? Yes? He wants the demon out of his son. What's the problem to the dad? The demon. What's the problem to Jesus? Unbelief. There are times where you face a situation that is bigger than your unbelief can handle. I'm, I'm going to dig a hole that I'll never crawl out of. I can feel it. Uh, there's a sucking sound into this, into this hole. There are times where 
the measure of faith as compared to all the questions that you keep pondering and keep questioning, keep meditating on, that you keep fueling with the energy of your own soul, it's too big of a battle. When you actually have the faith of God himself, that when it's by itself, is more than enough to move the mountain. But because you've allowed it to be planted with other competing things, you're in a war he didn't create for you. Prayer and fasting does not drive out demons. The, the devil doesn't get intimidated when I miss a meal. I think he finds it entertaining. It may be because I'm such a pitiful faster. I was fasting this week watching hunting shows where they cooked the food that they shot. I gravitate towards those kind. Leave me alone, just be quiet. I don't think the devil is intimidated by my fasting. is intimidated by my authority. And what happens in prayer and fasting is you discover who he is and you discover who you are. That's it. Let me rephrase it. Fasting for some of us at times have been, has been more likely called a hunger strike. <laughs> it's where you announce to God you're not eating until something happens. That's, that's funny to me. That's funny. That that would ever cross our mind. That, all right, you want me to fast? I'm fasting until this happens. It's not like fasting. It doesn't earn brownie points. You know, it doesn't, it, it doesn't, you know what it does? Fasting is where you are hungrier for something you can't see than what you can see. That's what it is. What does faith operate in? If it operates in the unseen. What does unbelief operate in? It operates in what you can see. It's the wallowing child foaming at the mouth. That's the challenge. The disciples, had they not been given a proper amount of authority to deal with that child? They had been. Jesus gave them all the authority needed to deal with any problem they faced. Did they deal with it? No, why? Too many seeds in the garden. Too much competing with what God had given them. They had the authority. It just, it was diluted in its use to minister to this problem. Fasting is learning to have an appetite for things you can't see. And as abstract as that sounds, it is the life of faith. As abstract and as unreasonable as that appears, it is where I become anchored in what Paul said, what you can't see is eternal, what you can see is temporal. So if my confidence is in this, that I can see, my confidence will crash, it will fail, because this is not reliable. My own human strength, it's not reliable. It can't be on any of those things. It can't be on human talent or skill. It has to be on something that is outside of that, that brings influence. A miracle comes. I've watched it so many times where a miracle comes. It's hard to explain, but it's in the unseen, and I see a problem, and the miracle just through faith gets released into that situation. And I've watched it change before my eyes. I've, I've seen it. I've seen it happen. I've seen where bones are missing and they grow. I've seen bones that were deformed and they dissolved. I've watched it. I've watched it where there's absolute 100% deafness and all of a sudden they hear. It was in the unseen, but it was released into the visible, into something that was inferior, in something that was damaged or destroyed or afflicted or whatever it might be. It's, it's that connection of the believer between the unseen world and the visible world. And I come as a representative. And that's why we don't beg God for the miracle. He's already decided to do it. Yeah. We're just learning to cooperate with the way he moves, the way he works, the way he thinks. Yes. Yeah. I'm so thankful for the Lord's prayer that he taught us to pray, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. 
your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The rest of the prayer, give us this day, is all petition prayer, but that, those two statements can be translated like this. Will of God, be done. Kingdom of God, come. They are decrees. It's a part of the prayer life. The prayer life has woven into it the responsibility to take the heart and mind of God and proclaim it into a given situation. The worlds were made out of him speaking. That's why he wants us to talk. But talk as a yielded vessel to him. Because then it's not just good ideas being declared into a situation. It's not just positive, the power of positive thinking. Which if that's all you have, don't lose it. You're depressing otherwise. This felt good to say. I don't know why. <laughs> so he says this kind only comes out with prayer and with fasting. Do you know what he's telling them? He's, he's saying, listen, the way to deal with unbelief is put your attention on that which is eternal. There's something about prayer. I, I don't understand this and I find it, I, I find that when I need this kind of praying the most is when I want to do it the least. And it's the prayer that is beyond words. It's the prayer that's beyond words. Sometimes it's praying in the spirit, praying in tongues, sometimes it's literally just being engaged with the presence of God with a groaning that's too deep for words. There are no words for what I feel, but I'm not going to leave this engagement. I'm not going to leave this moment. It's a face-to-face -face moment. I'm not manipulating or con controlling God. I simply want to be shaped by him. I want my heart to reflect his heart. I want my words to reflect his words. And there's these moments where he's just saying, listen, the problem isn't the demon. The problem is unbelief. And the antidote, learn to pray, be on convenience, and be willing to skip a meal to anchor into what you can't see. Why? Because that's where your authority functions from. Typically what gets done is <clears throat> creating all kinds of bad theology to explain why something didn't happen. Picture this today, if this were today, and we're the disciples, we try to get the child free. The child doesn't get free. And there's no Jesus in the flesh to bring deliverance. What do we do at the end of the day? Well, most places it's, well, God works in mysterious ways. We know that God is able to use this. I'm sure what he's doing is trying to really increase the level of devotion uh, to Christ and the prayer effort of this household. Instead of saying, there's too many seeds planted in my garden. I've got too many options. I've got too many other things to think, too many other things to believe. Because according to Jesus' example on the size of faith, it doesn't take this big a faith to move something as large as a mountain. It just takes this kind of faith. So when Jesus talks about great faith, greater faith, I don't know that he's talking about greater in a sense of size. I think he's describing whether or not that faith is by itself. It's the only seed in the garden. It's 
It's the only seed in the garden. That's why it's great. It's impact, it's significance, it's mountain moving. Weightiness is not in its size. It's in its quality. It's in its ability to stand by itself. I've been actually, in my own personal prayer time, been asking the Lord, talking to the Lord about this thing of authority because I, I became aware uh, several months ago, maybe six, eight months ago, maybe a little longer, that I was, I was so much stronger in being able to move in power than I was to move in authority. And I don't mean to, to imply I don't move in authority. I, I, I feel like I do, but, but I could tell if, if you could have power and authority, I got one leg that's a lot longer than the other one. And I, I want to be able to walk a way that represents him well in any situation. And some situations require power, but some power won't fix it. Sometimes. It's knowing who he is, knowing who you are, unashamedly taking your position and your posture and expelling that influence that is wreaking havoc on a household, on a city, on a situation. And I pray that in this next season, every one of us would see just personal breakthroughs, family breakthroughs, corporate breakthroughs, where this, to me, it's a mystery. It may be clear to you, but to me it's a mystery. That this mystery would become clearer. That there would be something more deeply rooted in who he made me to be that knows how to operate in both power and authority. Because I feel like we need it. I know I do. I know I'm in a situation right now where it's an issue of authority. And uh, I have had plenty of occasion to uh, do the guilt-shame thing. Uh, but but I, I danced with that partner years ago, and it just wasn't any fun. <laughs> I, they, I learned a long time ago, hopefully I'll remember that that one is, is not any fun and not rewarding at all. It gives such a false sense of spirituality. It's not authentic. It's not real. So for me, staying connected to the presence of God, the peace of God, the heart of God, and living simply. What I don't need is overexposure to things outside of my call. Busyness. Artificial significance. I don't need that because I know my temptation is I'm a responsible person and I will start taking responsible for things he didn't say I was responsible for. And those very things become the cares of this world that compete for the nutrient of the seed. So I pray for that for you. I pray that the Lord would give us a wisdom and a grace for this next season, a wisdom and grace that knows the difference between God's assignment and what just looks appealing. I pray that the Lord would put a spirit of wisdom and revelation on us as a people to know the difference between authority and power, to help us to know the difference, to recognize when he spotlights attitudes Simplest things. I've been asking God. I've been seeing the connection between certain kinds of infirmities and ways of thinking. I've been asking the Lord, point that out to me when it starts me because I don't, I don't want to let that thing grow. I'm not even aware of it. And these last two weeks, I've been seeing so many things. It just, it'll remind me of, a, of an experience I had 30 years ago. And I go, oh yeah, I released that person from all judgment. I refuse to come to a conclusion that would indict them. It's not my job. I release them from that. I pray the blessing of the Lord. And it just means throughout the day, I've got stuff just popping up all day long because I want to make sure. I want to do what Jesus did. He said, Satan has nothing in me. There was zero attachment. There was not one thought or idea in his head that somehow had its origin in the mind of the enemy. I pray that for you. 
And I especially pray that for me. Father, help us in this season to come into a, a level of authority that we've not known before and a true level of effectiveness that has been outside of our reach. Help us to never be the people that create a theology to allow a problem to exist. Instead, I pray that we would learn to take you aside and find out why. I, I, feel, like, I feel like I need to take about 30 seconds for something. There's this kind of praying it's the groaning that's beyond words. It's not a show. It's just, all I know is to say, is you get into this time, into the presence of the Lord, where all you have, you don't have words, you don't have a song, you just have that deep, deep moving the heart. It just, uh, and that's all you got. That's all you got. Don't leave it because it doesn't make sense. Stay locked in. Do what, like Chris said earlier, you pray till the burden lifts. You stay there. You may go into a song. You may go into a scripture. You may go into that, but don't be quick to leave those moments of engagement where you just stop and you just say, no, this must move. This that has been set against my household or my family or my friend, this must move. Complacency does not demonstrate the kingdom. You got two ways of progressing in the kingdom, the violence of faith and receiving as a child. Both are positions of extraordinary strength. One is authority, and the other is realized identity where you receive inheritance. And I pray this next season that you'd make these two things increase in our thinking, in our influence. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. One more thing, one more thing. I want to know if there's anybody here that has never... You don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. You don't know what it is to be forgiven. You don't know what it is to truly be a disciple, one who follows him. You're one who would say, Bill, I don't want to leave the building till I know what it is to have peace with God, to be forgiven by God, but also to be truly a disciple, one who follows Jesus. If that's anybody in the room, anybody online, and by the way, I forgot to welcome all of our online family. I bless you. Anyone online, anyone in the room, just put a hand up and just say, Bill, that's me. I don't want to leave the room until I know what it is to be born again. That I know what it is. Right over here. Wonderful. Yes. Right down here. Another one. Amen. Yeah. 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 Amen. Amen. Anyone else? Anyone else? Real quickly. Those who are online, please put in the chat box. We've got pastors on there ready to talk and to pray with you. Take advantage of this moment. We have so many people come to Christ online. I want to encourage you. Please respond to this. I want to have everybody stand. I'm going to ask for the two uh, gentlemen that raised your hands over here. <clears throat> Maybe if, if, yeah, if, come on down here. Maybe if you brought them uh, as a friend, come with them. Come on down to the front. And I need to have a couple of our guys come on over here. Yeah, bless them as they come down. Bless them. God bless you guys. Yeah. Yeah. Tom, go ahead. We want, we want them to leave with the entire package today. Yeah, so Absolutely good. filled with the Spirit of God, touched so powerfully. Others in this room, there is somebody else in here that needs to join them. There's, there's, there's at least one more person. I'm going to encourage you, get out of your seat right now and get down. And this group of people will love you, pray for you, and serve you in a way that will change the rest of your life. But I'm going to ask you just to get out right now. Church, just pray for that. Pray for that. Pray for those who are even online. It's just, it's not a day to be doing your own thing. It's a day to be found in the safety of following Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. 
Amen. I bless you. I'm so glad and happy to see you. Tom, wrap this up. Thank you.